Thanks for joining me on the HVAC School podcast. Hi. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, so this is um, a topic that I've been really excited about. I've been talking a lot about, which is in general indoor air quality, but thinking about it more broadly. Um, but you've been thinking about this stuff a lot longer than I have. So if you wouldn't mind, just introduce yourself and how you got into this whole world of air conditioning and indoor air quality and, and all the stuff we're going to talk about today. Yeah. So, uh, well, you go back 40 to 50 years ago as a young engineer and uh, worked for a few years in industry, mostly doing um, heating, cooling at a chemical processing plant, but uh, then went to grad school and became a professor in mechanical engineering at the University of Illinois for 30 years and my research has always been around energy and resources and sustainable living. The basic common thread is how do we live on our daily allowance of solar energy but that means how do we develop more efficient devices, how do we then collect solar energy, store it and then utilize it and so these cover from rainwater harvesting all the way through a healthy home that's comfortable and energy efficient at the same time. And I'm talking to you from a zero plus home in the middle of Illinois, which is actually one of the worst climates in the country. And, and we like being in a bad climate just because it lets us see how we can manage those Arctic blasts from Minnesota and those uh, nice hot humid waves from New Orleans in the summer. Yeah, the yeah, Illinois is Illinois is tough. Now I do notice that you're wearing a Detroit Lions uh, shirt, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So, yeah. so where did that come from? Are you <laughs> are you from that area? Or what, I'm a native it? Detroiter. Yeah. Okay. And, nice. Uh, even nice. though my family moved around a lot, uh, that uh, I've just stayed attached to Detroit teams, as miserable as they may be, <laughs> now and then. But uh, but yeah, Detroit's my hometown, and lots of relatives in the auto industry over the decades. Got it. Yeah. Well, as a, um, as a Barry Sanders fan growing up, uh, at least you have Barry to always go back on, even if you've had very few other successes. Oh yeah. So. Oh yeah. And <laughs> LK line. So, uh. <laughs> nice. All right. So tell me a little bit about, um, the, the company that, that you're now involved with and what you're, what you're building. Give me the kind of 50,000 foot view. So our company, which we're an engineering based company and, the parent company, what we call Newell Instruments, does a lot of research and development for the HVAC and our um, companies and of various sorts from components to systems. But then a branch that we developed uh, over 10 years ago that we call Build Equinox, it's devoted to developing technologies for sustainable, healthy, and comfortable living. And our primary focus right now is the development of a smart ventilation system for homes. One that senses the indoor air quality and then basically actively manages it uh, as, uh, as a home occupant's desire, but in a very simple manner. So there's a lot of technology behind it, but at the same time, that makes it easy to operate and gives somebody a peace of mind that their home is healthy. Yeah, and just to dig a little deeper into that, I've dived down the rabbit hole on this over the last few years, and you're exactly right. Um, in many cases, to make something simple for the end consumer, you have to make it pretty complex um, as a technology. And what I think you're pointing out here that I've bumped into is that there are a lot of pieces of equipment, um, we'll use the traditional ERV or maybe the ventilating dehumidifier that are useful and good pieces of equipment, but the control strategy, especially in a home and residential environment, it's not non-existent. I shouldn't say it's non-existent, but it's certainly not easy to set up and not easy for a consumer to manage. So is that what you've run into? Is that part of what you've uh, kind of designed around here? For sure. I mean, that was a major motivation. Um, in 2007, 2005, 2007, I was advisor for a uh, solar decathlon team from the University of Illinois. As we were looking at the technologies we were going to implement into the home, we were just seeing that what was available was just so deficient. You know, as you're hearing people describe these days with COVID, that Walking into a building is like playing Russian roulette. You don't know the air quality. You can't smell good air quality. And we saw from field studies and our research that homes are just, you know, we rely on happenstance, construction flaws to hopefully allow the wind to bring in some infiltrated air, which of course 
may not be that healthy either, depending on what passageways it takes in. And so we just started with a blank sheet of paper and with our background, looked at what technologies we could incorporate. And we came up with this device we call a CERV, a C-E-R-V, and started developing that in 2008. And the very first unit is in this house I'm sitting in that we built in 2010, and it's still purring away. And we built into that sensors uh, for carbon dioxide and volatile organic compounds. Either one of those may dominate the air quality in a home. And so these sensors keep the air at that level as it's occupied by more people or the activities of people are increased or cooking is generating VOCs that you want to remove from the air. And you're not left trying to decide whether you need to turn a dial to number one or number four fan speed. It's just doing that in the background for you. Yeah, which comes down to the to the simplicity side, which is so critical. So uh, before we jump into the CERV or CERV, I just want to do a quick summary for the audience of an ERV and tell me if I missed something that's pertinent to add here, because a lot of people have never worked with an ERV or maybe you never even seen one. Right. Um, yeah. when, when I installed an ERV on my house, when I built it several years ago, uh, the inspector who came and looked at it had no idea what he was looking at. He had never yeah. seen one before in all the homes he's, he'd inspected. Uh, even today, I would do it much differently than I did then, but I knew enough to you know think about it. And what an ERV does is it allows for your discharge air leaving your home to pass your intake air or your fresh air that you're intentionally bringing in. Hopefully it's fresh, but it's outdoor air. And those two air streams are crossing through a core and there's a ch exchange of energy. So in, in the case of an ERV, you have both a, an exchange of sensible and latent energy. So you do have a, a little bit of uh, dehumidification and some, and at least in our market, that's what we see, you know, dehumidification because mm -hmm. I'm in Florida. I always think in terms of Florida. So forgive me, a little bit of dehumidification and a little bit of cooling of that incoming air as it crosses past that air that's being discharged from the space. And that is, it, it, it does make a difference. But what we find is when we do a lot of the calculations is that often it isn't making as much of a difference as it would need to in order to really serve our market, which is why we often go to ventilating dehumidification instead of ERV technology. That's just a, a quick caveat there because a lot of people ask why we don't install many ERVs and that's the reason. Yeah. So did I miss anything there or anything else you would add as far no. as the basic ERV technology? Yeah, and that... Uh... You know, it's basically just operating at a steady uh, flow that somebody sets on, you know, simple controls. But uh, one of the big problems is that that doesn't mean you have good air quality. Another is that you don't always want to exchange energy between the incoming stream and the outgoing. In the evening, maybe two in the morning to six in the morning, it might be cooler outside and you'd be better off in, in Florida you'd be better off bypassing the heat exchanger or not trying to exchange energy because you're just deconditioning it if, uh, if it's nicer outside than inside. Um, and a place like, like Denver, seven, eight months out of the year, it's pretty nice outside. And the last thing you want to do is decondition it with, with your indoor air. And uh, so when you put some smarts into it, it knows, hey, it's nice outside. Let's bring all, all that outside air in and get inside very, very fresh. And then as it warms up later in the day, hey, let's uh, not be bringing in so much air, but it delays or minimizes how much air you need to bring in during that part of the day. And that's enormous, like you said, is that when we think about any solution and we imagine that one size fits all or that, hey, we always want to bring in outside air. Well, th that isn't always the case or we always want to exchange energy from inside to outside. That's not always the case. Um, and so that, that intelligence, uh, you know, using sensors in order to make decisions that we, we would have to essentially, you know, stand there all day and keep making adjustments in order to yeah. adjust for. Another side to this is that that uh, ERVs tend to be designed, and they, they don't always have to be designed this way, but they tend to be designed for balanced ventilation applications where you want just as much coming in as going out. And that also isn't always the case. And in, in our market, we would actually prefer to have a little bit more coming in than going out uh, mm -hmm. because we don't mind a little bit of positive pressurization in our market. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, exactly right. So it can be tuned and, you know, the way the wind blows will also impact that balance or imbalance. And since we have decoupled the two air streams. They roughly run in balance, but 
we use a heat pump which isolates the stream that's getting cooled from the stream that's getting warm. And either one of those might be the one coming in or going out depending on the season. But with a heat pump then, we don't have them integrally tied together. Plus we can do more than just uh, try to exchange energy. We can condition the air coming in. In your case, both remove moisture um, as well as cool it. Uh, and in the wintertime, heating the air above and beyond room temperature as it comes in. All right. So there, there's, a, there's the real magic of the, of the serve or CERV versus an ERV. I mean, you could just kind of slip that in there, but this is a really mm -hmm. big distinction. Yeah. You're actually using a heat pump here. So for somebody who is maybe used to heat pumps, but has no idea how this would work, how would you simply explain? Obviously, it's easier if you, you know, go to the website and pull up an image, but for people who are just listening to this, how would you explain how that how how that actually works. Yeah, so that, that heat pump, uh, you know, any technician opening it up would see a compressor. It looks just like uh, what they see in room air conditioner or a refrigerator, and then connected to an evaporator and a condenser or two heat exchangers. In our case, we use microchannels, so very advanced heat exchangers. And then uh, it's an inverter drive compressor, about appliance scale. It's like about a four or 500 watt compressor by Embraco. And then digital controls on, uh, on the compressor speed, as well as the uh, expansion valve, and then a reversing valve. So we can turn the evaporator into a condenser and vice versa on the other. And basically in the winter time, at least for us, where as we're bringing in fresh air from the outside, we're heating that air and the air that we're rejecting from the house, we're uh, pulling heat out of that. We'll cool that down below freezing when the weather's you know nice and cold and move that heat over into the fresh air that's coming in. We're also uh, pulling moisture out of the air that's getting exhausted in the winter and that latent heat gets turned into part of the sensible heat that's coming inside. And that can be a fair amount of that heat addition. And in the summertime, it's just the opposite. We'll take uh, that nice, warm, humid air that you have, and we'll pull heat out of that and condense water out as much as about 10 to 12 liters a day when it's really humid. And then that goes in the stream that we're exhausting from the house. The surf runs at about 200 cubic feet per minute, which is quite a bit higher than typical ventilation standards for, for a home. And that means that when a house becomes polluted, we can flush it out fairly fast, respond to that, that uh, air quality loading. And then the rest of the time, we're typically in a recirculation mode. And it may either be a powered mode where we're, say in, in the case of summer, contributing our roughly third of a ton capacity to the cooling load of the house. And in the winter time, the same thing, but contributing our heating capacity to the house. And then if the house is in its comfort range and doesn't need heating or cooling, we'll typically be in a recirculation mode where just the indoor fan is moving air around in the house. And this is important for a couple of reasons. It uh, helps even out the air quality throughout the house. Good fresh air that's stored, say, in an unused bedroom or other unoccupied space of the house. We want to make sure that gets passed by people. And then we also, it's important to recirculate in order to remove particulates. And especially these days with contagion-laden particulates, it uh, significantly reduces the ability of a contagion that's in a house, some infectious person, to make someone else sick inside the house. So there's these different things going on within the SERS management of the house uh, air quality. Got it. So when you're saying recirculation mode, what you're saying is, um, just to make sure that I'm getting this straight, when you're in recirculation mode, your outdoor air is traveling through, going across a condenser or evaporator, and then returning directly back outdoors, and yep. your indoor air is doing the same. It's going in. And so essentially, right. you're creating a, a supplementary um, air conditioner or heater that's working along with your system. And I would imagine that that's especially handy um, in very low load homes where you're trying to design your loads really tight. And so it gives you that additional additional kind of reserve energy that you can use uh, as you needed bet, yeah. to supplement. Yeah, we're, we're in a lot of very high performance homes, homes that uh, might just need us plus maybe a one ton mini split, which are just 
you know, accelerating in popularity. And now we're seeing the uh, rapid growth of ducted mini splits where the ductless were among the first coming in the uh, U.S. It seems like the U.S. market prefers having something behind the scenes, moving conditioned air in. And so we're coupled in a number of our projects with, uh, with ducted units, but we operate with uh, geothermal units and radiant units and, and all sorts of units, whether we operate independently or we're coupled in some manner. Oftentimes, we're doing the controlling since uh, the controls in our unit are very advanced. They're all online. We uh, have over-the-air upgrading, which we offered that when Tesla was first coming out with that in Tesla, where you know each night uh, new features and options might get downloaded and and all of a sudden now you can do this or that with your system. So it's very advanced, but at the same time that we're talking about really just plugging in a 120 outlet, it draws about 700 watts at maximum. Flip the switch on and it's off and running. Wi-Fi is built in. There's local wireless that lets you have an array of other features and options that depend on the complexity of the house that, um, that folks select. Got it. And so if I'm imagining this correctly, then the heat pump is essentially replacing the core. So what was right. once, so you don't have a separate core, the heat pump is the core. That's, that's yes. where your energy transfer yeah. is occurring. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Very interesting. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense too, because now you have it, these advantageous air streams where you're attempting to draw air or extract, or sorry, dr extract heat via evaporative coil from an airstream that's already leaving the house. Therefore it's a higher temperature. And then the right. opposite is true on the condenser side. So it, it gives you a lot of controls. And I imagine having that, um, I, is it a, is it a rotary compressor? Is that, is that what it is? It, uh, it's a little reset. No, it's a little reset. Okay. Yeah. But having that, uh, that variable speed uh, capability yeah. gives you the, the ability to really dial that in from a compression ratio standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. The reset we use, it's out of uh, Embraco, which is uh, uh, more on the appliance side right. rather than say the air conditioning side. And in that gray area where the two kind of overlap, the appliance side of compressors tend to be quieter than the air conditioning side is you know, refrigerators made to go in a house where, right. you know, your air conditioner is outside the house. Yeah, I did an interview with Embraco uh, a couple AHRs back. Is a good company. They make a lot of really nice stuff. What, what yeah. refrigerant does that use? So it uses 134A, which is okay. on the uh, appliance side as well. Right. And, uh, but we're also poised and the architecture we've designed into this thing is such that uh, as those decisions, which are you know above our pay grade, are made for the next generation of refrigerants. The low global warming potential refrigerants will be able to swap those in. So whether it's a synthetic like the uh, 1234 uh, that you may have been hearing about, or say on the hydrocarbon or natural refrigerant side, that uh, that everything's made for dropping either one of those into the unit. Yeah, I was going to say 290 seems like that would be a logical choice so long as you can get everybody to stop being so alarmist about it. But, uh, exactly. Definitely, I mean, it's all throughout Europe and, uh, South America and yeah. it's, it's a great refrigerant and, uh, you know, and you can barbecue a couple of steaks with it too. <laughs> Hopefully not in your attic. That yeah, would be, uh, not, not, yeah. uh, not the same, not, the same unit. <laughs> not ideal. Not <laughs> ideal. Um, yeah, absolutely. Well, great. That's, yeah, that's super interesting. Where have you seen it being adopted? You know, what challenges have you seen? What problems have you seen it solving? I mean, obviously it seems like it, it's a great technology, but a lot of us have never heard of it or haven't seen it yet. Where are you yeah. um, from the go-to-market strategy standpoint? We're a tiny company. There's about 400 of these units scattered around North America now. As we tell people, it's the worst marketing strategy in the world to, you know, spread it out in that manner. But over the past uh, seven, eight years has been on the market, and we're now in our second generation unit, what we call the Serve 2 that we released three years ago. But because of the online nature of it, and not everybody wants it online, it doesn't need to be, can just be fully wired and operational. More than half of them are online. And what this does is it also gives us continuous feedback. You know, we don't have the environmental, the arrays of environmental test chambers and accelerated testing that, you know, the big companies have. But we are running the world's largest experiment in indoor air quality in residences that I'm aware of. And so we're learning and incorporating those into the new machines. 
And so this strategy has allowed us to cut our teeth in all climate zones. The first passive house in Florida, first certified passive house in Florida, in Gainesville has one of our units, uh, as well as uh, uh, as far north as you can go in Vermont, up into Canada, and then over in the desert southwest. So this has really given us great insight into how people pollute their homes, how much air is needed to manage that, and then how to do that in an energy efficient manner. On top of that, just seeing that our heat pump is bulletproof. The architecture that we use, you mentioned that you work with like grocery store uh, uh, refrigeration systems, which uh, a lot of your audience already knows are some of the most sophisticated, complex systems as far as the defrost algorithms and control algorithms. And we kind of look at our unit as part grocery store refrigeration system, part vending machine, you know, this kind of bulletproof stuff that if it fails, uh, you know, you've got a lot of food going bad or, you know, that vending machine that has to sit outside a gas station in Yuma, Arizona or Nome, Alaska. And so that's the type of uh, architecture we put in. So no defrost heaters, no sump heaters on this unit. Those are often, you know, as your audience knows, among the first things that go bad. So this thing is just inherently protected from, uh, you know, ultra low charge. So inherently protected from slugging the compressor or diluting or foaming the the oil and stuff like that. Yeah, which is probably uh, one of the big uh, considerations in using microchannel as well is that you do have you much bet. lower system charges. Yeah, because as yeah. soon as you said that, I just thought, oh boy, you know, like half of my audience hates microchannel because they see the issues in our rooftop units where they're exposed and they are easily damaged. But in a case like this, where it's all kind of contained and well protected, yeah. microchannel really is the right choice. And like you mentioned, we've seen this on other products that people have made. There's a couple product dehumidification products that uh, potentially have a long line sets and they in the engineering didn't think about the effects of additional charge and how that can impact yeah. um, simple systems that have capillary tubes and that sort of thing. But you basically ticked all the boxes from an engineering standpoint. Obviously, that's your background, um, but you've built yourself a tank by the sounds of it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we, uh, my research background at the university, we do a lot of studies on how much oil gets entrained and carried around the system. And there's always a conflict between the, the compressor side of us. We want as much oil in the system as possible. And then the heat transfer side of us, we don't want any oil in because it's you know uh, impairing uh, and reducing heat transfer. And, uh, and so we're very familiar with all of those issues. And, and basically, yeah, uh, uh, micro channels are a great technology uh, they're in front of every vehicle on the road now driving seven, well, in Florida, 80 miles an hour and, uh, you know, getting hit with bugs and things. So they are durable, but, you know, you get a kid with a stick around them and, uh, and that's not good. You mentioned, so you, you opened up a, a Pandora's box here because it's something that I'm in the process of trying to understand better. You mentioned oil carry. This topic comes up a lot where technicians will say, or you'll hear people say that POE oil or uh, PVE oil is fully miscible in the refrigerant. And then they'll say that and they'll repeat it. My understanding of this term miscible is that that is a liquid and liquid mixture so that they, they, they make a solution uh, yeah. liquid and liquid, but yeah. we're not carrying oil with only liquid. We also have vapor in the suction line and past the evaporator. And so I think it's a common misconception that oil carry, based on the research I've been doing, and I, and I was one of the ones who would repeat it because I would hear people say that, well, mm -hmm. it's fully miscible, but oil carry still matters, right? I mean, and, and yeah. there is still yeah. this this issue of vapor doesn't, vapor refrigerant, even if in its liquid form, it's fully miscible, it still isn't fully miscible with liquid oil. Am I missing so, something there? It's, it's, it's a question uh, that I have had recently. The, 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 the POE uh, in the liquid phase of the refrigerant is fully miscible. You, you can't see it where something like an alkyl benzene with say 134A or 410A is as immiscible as possible. It looks like, you know, uh, Italian salad dressing moving through and we've done a lot of visualization studies at the University of Illinois, looking at how immiscible oils uh, move through a system relative to miscible oils. But when the refrigerant is boiled off into a, a vapor, say in the evaporator, the oil stays liquid and the remaining liquid refrigerant fraction is still mixed in. And somewhere, say the, say the last third of the heat exchanger 
uh, where there's still a fair amount of refrigerant to boil off, it's not fully vaporized, that's where the oil makes its biggest impact and it's just like molasses or syrup moving through. It's a very viscous liquid at that point. And, but the vapor's flying through and dragging that liquid along the side of the tube. From the expansion valve to, say, where it's about 70% quality or the, you know, two-thirds of the way through, there the oil impact, it, it might cause some foaming. And there's arguments that foaming can sometimes be good because it's kind of wiping in the evaporator, the tubing with a liquid film. Mm -hmm. uh, and keeping the whole tube wetted is important. But the oil is not so viscous with the amount of refrigerant mixed in it. With something like an alkyl benzene, you have kind of the same thing, except it floats on refrigerant. Refrigerant's pretty dense, like motor oil is not that dense. Uh, motor oil is a little dense, uh, less dense than water, floats on top of water. Refrigerant's a little denser than water in liquid phase. And so it kind of floats along, which is a good thing. But then again, once you hit a, that last third of the evaporator, it starts being able to grab into the wall. And now you've got this very viscous patch that's not letting liquid refrigerant get to the wall to be boiled off. But both the, the PAG, which you see over in the automotive systems, and then the POEs and, and other... Um, uh, DDEs and things that are, say, on more of the refrigeration side, they are fully miscible in the liquid range. To summarize this, and this is completely off the topic of what we're talking about, but it's it's fascinating to me. And while I have a, a smart engineer on the line, I wanted to ask this because I've been struggling with this. It's still absolutely true to say that that miscibility is an attribute for sure. But to say that oil is miscible in vapor refrigerant is, is an incorrect statement then, correct? Regardless yeah. of the refrigerant type. There's maybe a little bit of oil has been vaporized, but by and large, it's essentially non-volatile and just stays a liquid. And uh, this is where superheat's very critical too. And, and one of the advantages of like microchannels, because in our case, we don't have to worry about superheat. If we happen to let more refrigerant through than what can be boiled off at a certain condition, or the coil freezes up, uh, to us, big deal, uh, liquid refrigerant is passing through, getting in the compressor, but the charge is low enough, it doesn't build up in the compressor. Okay. But when you do control, when you're doing superheat control, so you're essentially trying to keep that last third or so of the heat exchanger dried out. Now you've got a fair amount of oil stuck inside your heat exchanger. That part of the heat exchanger is not being very effective. You know, as much as maybe a third of your oil reservoir is held up there, as well as the return line getting back to the compressor. I get it. So your point being that in, in a case where the refrigerant charge is so small, even if that liquid refrigerant does make it into the compressor and maybe there'd be a little bit of foaming the oil or a little bit of, you know, that turbulence yeah. in the oil, yeah. it's not enough that it's going to damage uh, yeah. or actually make it into uh, the point where it, would, where it would really slug. Yeah. And, and this is true on big units too. I mean, we've uh, developed uh, large military, 25, 30 ton, uh, compressor systems with microchannel uh, uh, condensers in that case, and then fin tube, typical copper fin tube evaporators. But where a 30 ton unit was uh, using about 12, 13 pounds of uh, 410A charge in it. Go ahead, let all the refrigerant, freeze up the coils, let all the refrigerant pass through to the uh, compressor. It's not going to bother it. Yeah. And that's actually an interesting um... This goes along with something that I've thought for a long time. And of course, I'm not an engineer. So most of the things that I look at are qualitative. You know, I've, I've observed something. That's important. I mean, that's, uh, why we, that's why we've done so much visualization because nobody's smart enough to sit with pencil and paper and theoretically <laughs> figure this out. Especially when you're as bad at math as I am. But what I've observed is it seems like uh, we actually don't give compressors enough credit for their ability to handle liquid. And in fact, we often run higher superheats to the detriment of the compressor due to overheating. So yeah. I think we're probably killing... As many if not more compressors nowadays with these you know with the way that we're engineering equipment through overheating than we are through uh you know preventing we have this strong desire to yeah. prevent uh flooded running and flooded starts in some cases i guess are probably still a thing and split systems where you have long long line sets and that sort of thing yeah. um, but what you're saying kind of reconfirms that with modern microchannel lower refrigerant charge technologies yeah for sure it's a benefit and then as you think of perhaps going to hydrocarbons or things like ammonia, which is really well suited to microchannels that 
getting the charge minimized uh, just on the hazard side it has a real benefit. Yeah, I would love us to find more ways to utilize ammonia safely because that is a tremendous refrigerant from the latent heat content of, of that particular uh, refrigerant and, re and reduction of charge. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a beautiful refrigerant. Uh, yeah. Just the, it's the killing you part that's kind of inconvenient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, uh, you know, uh, a friend of mine uh, at York says that, uh, you know, if only uh, the Freons, you know, smelled bad, but, you know, the fact that you could inhale it and blow out a candle, which in one, you know, in that aspect was a wonderful advance over methylene chloride, uh, sulfur dioxide, and ammonia. You know, at that time, we thought, you know, something had to kill you right away, and now we know uh, different. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, it's over time. It's just as bad. So we've we've talked in a circle here, but it's really good stuff. This has actually been a lot more fun than I thought it would be. Um, let's talk a little bit about the problem that we're solving. I actually want to start there, and then I forgot to hit it. With the serve, I think one of the big challenges and why we don't see more of this technology, because undisputedly, what you've built is a tremendous solution, but some people maybe don't see the problem. Let's discuss that for a second. What is the big problem that we're solving for in the world that we live in today? Yeah, so... Uh let's say uh, three problems. One is our health. And in terms of our health, uh, both uh, our, our long-term health, that we've been immersed in indoor environments now with materials that are volatilizing, uh, as well as cleansers and other chemicals around us, that we haven't been used to being submerged in before. And, uh, you know, developing cancers and other things like that. And then say on the short-term basis that uh, at current standards for ventilation, fresh air ventilation, we get sick more often, even pre-COVID, that uh, the standards haven't been adequate for the basic flu and colds, which is you know well over a hundred billion dollar problem a year, uh, sick days and and medical visits. And then on top of that, there's the cognition problem that your brain functions better with lower levels of CO2 and VOCs. And at least for someone like me, I need all the help I can get to improve my thinking. So, you know, keeping the air fresh is, uh, it impacts decision-making, it impacts your quality of sleep, it impacts your creativity, your ability to focus and organize information. And so these are uh, some of the critical factors, but the problem is that our current standards, whether commercial buildings, ASHRAE 62.1 ventilation standards, or the residential 62.2, these are odor-based standards that basically came out of the 1930s. Put a person in a box, blow a little air through it, and the tests which were conducted at Yale in the 30s with a recently showered and clean clothed person, and then have people sniff the air coming out of that box. And when only 20% of them were dissatisfied with the air quality, that's where our, say, rule of thumb, 20 CFM per person came from. But you cannot smell healthy air. You cannot smell air that has uh, a virus in it or some other contagion or chemicals that are going to impact you over a significant period of time. And that's really the problem we wanted to solve. On top of that, you know, over the past 20 years, we've seen more than doubling of asthma and allergies. And while we don't know the causation, we know that maintaining good fresh air levels in a home is going to reduce the potential for an asthma attack or uh, an allergic outbreak. And so what we view, uh, and, and a large part of our customer base are folks with those respiratory sensitivities, and we view their home as that place of refuge, that one place where they can open a door and walk in and know that they can relax, they can de-stress. Where any other building they walk in, as we mentioned, um, you know, playing Russian roulette, you don't know the air quality. So every time someone with that sensitivity walks in, they're really wondering, am I going to be able to take a breath or, you know, is something going to happen in here? And stress is bad. You know, stress absolutely puts you in that fight or flight cortisol producing mode rather than the peaceful oxytocin producing mode that helps you heal and feel good. And that's a big 
big part of what we do as well as try to work with people so they regain confidence in their home. If they've had a problem with, uh, say, molds or allergens or other, other things in their home environment. Yeah, and along the way, you know, this particular product is also solving for the issue that in some markets bringing in outdoor air is expensive. You know, it's expensive to, to bring it in and then to treat it. And uh, so we haven't really had great solutions to this problem in the past because there's so many different considerations in order to decide how much should come in and uh, what are the impacts of bringing it in and does it need to be treated or not? And yeah. is it helpful to exchange, you know, uh, thermal energy from the, from the discharge to the intake airstream? There's all these questions. Yeah. that we haven't really had good technology to solve. I mean, I've thought about these problems in a very infantile way for years. And it's finally, we've got, you know, some people who are who are focusing on building something that really does this. Um, and it sounds like that's what you've built. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, we've been fortunate to be in a position from our research over many years of first having the contacts within industry. So it's interesting with folks at, you know, all the major companies as well as the component manufacturers is that nobody's ever heard of a, of a device like this and, and we're just now starting to recognize the need for it. So we're not going into a piece of, into a, a pie that already exists and trying to grab an existing piece of pie. We're not developing, say, a new air conditioner or a new refrigerator that then maybe has 10%, you know, difference in efficiency. But this is a whole new pie. So for any of the manufacturers, whether, uh, you know, whether they see a potential for themselves in the future, we're really trying to develop a new market that may have new opportunities for them as they're trying to explore what is a healthy home? What are people looking for? We think we have you know, a major solution. Uh, we'll find out. The market will let us know that. But we're continually growing and feeling optimistic as, you know, as we move into the future. And then at some point, move beyond the word of mouth, which is our main uh, marketing effort at this point. Yeah, and I'd like to be part of that. So if there are contractors out there who are hearing this, or maybe even consumers, we have a lot of consumers who listen uh, to this to try to find solutions. In fact, I had a dentist uh, who called me from South Florida and said uh, he wanted us to help with his strategy for indoor air quality because he, he hadn't heard anybody talk so honestly about IAQ. And that's what we're doing yeah. here, especially on the, you know, we talk about three things more than anything else, fil filtration, uh, ventilation, specifically fresh air, uh, and then de dehumidification in our market or humidity yeah. control in yeah. general. Um, those are really the three pieces of the pie. Your product helps to some degree with all three of these. So if people want to find out more about it or they, you know, maybe are interested in purchasing one, what, what do they do next? Yeah. And so, you know, on our website at buildequinox.com, you know, there's both, you know, the information on the serve or the serve two now our second generation unit and then, you know, form. And then it's very simple, direct sales, a few places we have uh, reps uh, around the country, but mostly it's direct sales. And most of the folks we're dealing with are builders, architects, uh, installers, and, uh, and homeowners. And uh, so it's a very simple process. As far as information, though, also on our website, you'll find a lot of resources, for example, on humidity and latent loads, which especially this day and age, as homes are getting sealed up more, and they're getting more latent dominated than uh, sensible dominated for cooling. For sure, you're ground zero for uh, latent loads in the US. You'll find a four part report series and as I tell people, if they're suffering from insomnia, definitely one, if not all four, will knock you out. <laughs> but, you know, we go through how does moisture get generated, what amounts, and it's both field study, real data, along with modeling. And then uh, we talk about the climatic variations throughout the U.S. And then the machines that we have available for managing it. So in a Florida, heat pump water heaters, which they'll be in every home. No ifs and buts about it. They're starting to pick up. It's been a slow growth, but that realization is getting there. And in Florida, you get so much liter per day of latent conditioning out of a heat pump water heater, along with some cooling. And then a unit like the serve, which will also contribute to the cooling and latent. And then whatever type of whether a geothermal or a, say a mini split or a central you'll get its say bulk conditioning for comfort and then whatever it can contribute to uh, late 
And then on top of that, what's typical in your environment, uh, adding then some type of DHUM unit, a ducted DHUM unit. And the CERV we look at is the brains of all of that. So in Florida, it's common for us to be managing the, say, multiple mini splits as well as a, a DHUM unit that's directly coupled to our system. Since we have the humidity sensors built in as well as the air quality, we can manage when the DHUM unit's needed and when it's not. And then uh, we have reports on smart ventilation, which show you why smart ventilation is much more energy efficient, even though our prime mission is air quality. When you smartly ventilate, you gain a lot in energy efficiency. And in Florida, that means not unnecessarily bringing in uh, moisture. And, and the reason you don't see ERVs in Florida uh, is that people are getting smart about it and understanding that, well, usually where I'm exhausting from my bathroom or my kitchen, and those are pretty humid areas. So even as humid as Florida is, somebody takes a shower in the bathroom, that stream is actually more humid than the outside. And with an ERV, you're actually transferring more moisture into that already humid outside moisture and creating more problems. We're always benefiting the moisture balance as we operate. Yeah, because you're using sensors versus just guessing. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and I imagine another thing that a lot of people think when they hear about sensors, including me, is that, you know, well, sensors have problems, but um, I imagine you've taken a lot of uh, a care in choosing your sensor technologies. You bet, but I mean, you still just never know, you know, that accelerated testing, you know, as we have a five-year warranty, you know, you're just waiting for that first unit you sold, you know, back in our case, 2013 to hit five years. And then you have a celebration as, you know, you know, more units make it through that. And, and sensors are a big part of that. You know, you know, five, 10 cent part with a unit that's in Northern Vermont or, you know, uh, Southern Florida, that gets expensive to repair. And so we've been very careful on that, but we use all the best. And as I mentioned, you know, our background, we've designed a lot of conditioning units for uh, like military applications. So we're used to mil spec and, you know, everything is top quality industry, uh, leading compressor and, and components are all built into this. Absolutely. Great. Um, so one more time, what's the, what's the best uh, website? Uh, where do people go to find out more? Buildequinox.com and check out the multimedia section to see our newsletter and a bunch of reports and webinars that, that take you through um, the CERV. But then there's a lot of documentation on that as well. And, and, uh, and a lot of features beyond just the basic unit that folks may, uh, may enjoy seeing. Ultraviolet air purification, we just came out with that feature. Zone dampering as you get into larger, more complex homes, as well as an array of battery-free wireless switches and other devices that communicate with the serve to tell it the bathroom needs to have ventilation or somebody's occupying this space or air quality in this space is uh, out of range. Excellent. Well, whether you like it or not, um, based on this, uh, you have now become my uh, ventilation expert. So I'm going to be irritating you a lot moving <laughs> forward. So, Well, I, I'm more than happy to do that as well as, uh, you know, I've been fortunate and as well as being old and decrepit, you know, having a lot of contacts in the industry. So, I, you know, if I can't answer it often, I can find someone who can. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Ty. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah, thank you very much, Brian. We'll, we'll be in touch. Mm -hmm.